great-great-grandfather on the Holly side left Kentucky for Illinois and changed the spelling of our last name. My brother and sister and I always thought he was probably a horse thief. So I don't really want to look into my ancestry too deep to figure out why my name is what it is. But if we were to go far enough back, our ancestors were all on a big boat during a big flood. We were all descendant from Noah and his wife. And they therefore descendants of one of those three boys, Shem, Ham, or Japheth. And Japheth is the first one recorded in Genesis chapter 10. And verses 2 through 5 says this, The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Ripheth and Togermah. The sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim and Dodanamin. From these, got through the names, verse 5 though, catch this. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, and to their nations. The Mediterranean coast. Japheth's sons liked the water. And they migrated... You know, they must have, you know, been up there on the, on the ark and thinking, this is fun going sailing. I'd like to do this more often. You know, they probably had a little John boat for fishing and they had a sailboat for recreation and they settled in the coastlands. And nations developed around those descendants of Noah's son Japheth. You know, you might even notice Tarshish was the name of one of the sons. Where was Saul? who later became Paul from Tarshish, a city that was named after this fellow centuries before. And that would have been in what today is southern Turkey. <laughs> we get the sons of Ham next. Makes you wonder if he had a good sense of humor. If he was the class clown, the cut up. He was a Ham, you get it? Yeah, this is going over really well today, isn't it? Yeah, how many of you want me to go back on vacation? Gretchen's hand went up. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> now, this is lengthy. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's lengthy and I, I really I will butcher the names. I want to start, though, in verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush and Mistraim and Put and Canaan. And then he goes on. Now, Cush, in verse 8, becomes the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And from that land, he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth Ur and Calah and Rezin between Nineveh and Calah. Mizraim became the father of Ludum and and I can't do that one, and a couple of other guys. It is hard. My tongue just won't do it. I want to pause here for a minute, though, and point out a couple of things. Maybe you know this, but as we walk through Scripture, and remember, Scripture isn't a bunch of disjointed stories. It is one story weaving from the Garden of Eden to the culmination in the book of Revelation. It's one story. And as we read about the sons of Ham, this is interesting. Do you know another name for Misraim? Egypt. <laughs> the, the son of Ham, Misraim, that's, that's Egypt. Matter of fact, Orthodox Jews today don't speak of Egypt. They speak of Misraim, even today. Cush has a son called Nimrod. You know, usually we use that in a derogatory manner. You were such a Nimrod. <laughs> you know? But he was a mighty hunter in the presence of the Lord. This was a great man. And notice, he, he, he establishes a number of cities and, and countries, if you will. Babel? Babylon. Nineveh, to which Jonah 
would be sent via submarine. <laughs> Come on, hang with me, folks. <laughs> Too much smoke inhalation on Wednesday or whatever day that was. I think it kind of got to my lungs and my brain. If you go down, who was another one of Ham's sons? Canaan. And if you were to read from verses 15 on down through 20, the sons of Canaan are listed. And you'll hear those names many times when we get to the battles of the book of Joshua and the taking of the promised land. As the story unfolds, what you find is <laughs> not only do different countries develop, but so do animosities. The sons of Ham don't get along with the sons of Shem. Some of the greatest enemies of the people of Israel are named here in Genesis chapter 10. Where did they spend 400 years as slaves? Egypt. What country did God use to take them off into exile for 70 years? Babylon. What nation absolutely obliterates, never to be restored, the northern kingdom of ten tribes? Assyria. Misraim, Babylon, Assyria are all right there in the genealogy of Ham. Isn't that sad? 1800s, 1860s, the United States and the Confederate States. And have you ever studied history? And you guys know this. It wasn't just north against south. It was houses divided as one brother would take up arms in the blue and another brother would take up arms with the gray and they would fight against each other. What is it about us human beings? It reaches way back, folks. Actually, beyond Noah, it reaches back to Cain and Abel. And brother taking up arms against brother. Hold on to the fact that good old Nimrod <laughs> had gone to the land of Shinar. We're going to return there in a little bit. But there's another son. There were, there were three sons. My, my three sons. <laughs> we watched that when we were kids. I think it was a different three sons, though. We have Shem. And from Shem, we have the Semitic tribes. Have you ever heard of anti-Semitism? Hatred for the Semitic peoples. Primarily hatred for Jews, exhibited not just in Nazi Germany, but exhibited throughout history. The descendants of Shem, beginning at verse 21, and also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam and Asher and Arpachshad and Lud and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz and Hull and Gether and Mash. How do you guys pick out names for your children? Arpachshad became the father of Shelah and Shelah became the father of Eber. And two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided. Interesting that as we go through all these names, not much is said. Nimrod gets a little bit of extra, but so does Peleg. In his days, the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And if you continue down through chapter 10, you follow Joktan's line, but that's all we ever hear of them. And in verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations, and out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. All the peoples. 
But in chapter 11, we find that even though they're spread across the face of the known earth at that time, they're developing their own cities, they're developing their own nations, if you will, maybe a little different than what we understand nations to be, but nonetheless, they're there. We get to chapter 11 in the ancient story of the Tower of Babel. Now, who built Babel? Nimrod. And we're told in chapter 11 that the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Wouldn't that make it easier? This past week that just ended, I had the pleasure, I had the joy of being a volunteer for the Professional Disc Golf Association World Championships. You think, oh, you're doing throwing plastic at basket, right? No. We had people from 15 different countries in the Peoria area competing for the title of number one. Okay, amongst juniors, 18 and younger, and amateurs, those just not yet hitting the pros. On Friday, I got to sit at the T for first hole and announce the cards. I got to call off their names. And this young lady from Norway showed up. And I said, oh my goodness, how do you say your name? And she told me, and I said, could you repeat that? <laughs> and we did that about six times. And I get up and I do my spiel and I announce her name and she goes, <laughs> I got one. And from New Zealand, and from France, and from Colombia, and I am butchering name after name. But boy, wouldn't it be nice? They were all of one language, and they used the same words. You know, let's forget different languages. Have you tried talking to a teenager today? You said, what? That word means what? Now, in my day, it meant something different. You ever, have you come across that one yet? You know? I can't sing Christmas carols anymore. I can't sing Don We Now Are Gay Apparel. And I'm not trying to be funny there. Language changed. We don't use the same word. The, the words don't even have the same meaning anymore. They had the same language and the same words. And it came about, as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Nimrod's land. And they settled there and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Did you hear the motivation? Let's make for ourselves a name. Not let's make a name for God. Not let's make God famous. Not let's honor the one who should be honored. Let's shine the spotlight on ourselves. Pride. Pride. And verse 5 gives us a touch of irony because what did they say? Let us build a tower that reaches into the heavens. We're going to ascend. We're going to go high. And in verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the Son of Man had built. That's not just about location. That, that, that's an irony. Man's pride rose to this height and God still had to come down to see it. God still had to come down and say, <laughs> you guys, who do you think you are? And so in the conversation amongst the Trinity, God says, let's confuse their language. Let's stir the pot a little bit. And they won't be able to understand each other. And it will add to the division. And that's just what God did. And people were scattered 
across the whole earth. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Isn't it interesting, man's pride had said, if we do this, we won't be scattered. Did you catch that? But God scatters them. The best laid plans of mice and men, if not in, con in concert with the will of God, will fail. And that city was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. I'd mentioned Peleg earlier in the descendants of, 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 of Shem. And remember what happened in his day? The world was divided. You can actually follow the history. As Shem's descendants get to Peleg, it is in the time of Peleg that this Tower of Babel takes place and language is confused and not only are now nations and, and countries and tribes, but there are languages as well. If you've been attending these sermons through the book of Genesis, what's my final point been every week? Someone tell me. Grace. The final point every week has been grace. Because there is grace here. While God has to stop humanity from becoming so proud that he forgets that he is dependent upon God, chapter 11, beginning at verse 10, says these are the records of the generations of Shem. Okay, we'd had the, the lineage of, of, Ab, uh, of Adam. We'd had the, the lineage of, of Seth. We have the lineage of Shem the Semitic tribes, because who's going to come ultimately through the line of Shem? Jesus. And so, without reading the names, you can try to stumble through them later, if you will, in chapters 10 and 11. The author takes us down through generation to generation. And it says in verse 16, Eber lived 34 years and became the father of Peleg, and Eber lived 430 years after he became the father of Peleg, and he had other sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and became the father of Reu. And Peleg lived 209 years after he became the father of Reu, and he had other sons and daughters. And you go down, verse 20, 22, 24, Nahor. There's another name that we'll hear again in just a little while. He lived 29 years and became the father of Terah. And Terah lived 70 years and he became the father of Abram. And God will take Abram and will change his name to Abraham. Chapter 11, after this great division of humanity, after again having to squelch the pride of mankind, God brings us to Abraham. Abraham's the first Hebrew. Abraham is the beginning of a whole new race. People that God will use to bring salvation to every nation, every tribe, every language, every tongue. I grew up in Kansas, Illinois. I may have told you this story before. I was probably early high school. Kansas, Illinois was and is a Caucasian town. We were all white. We knew of other races because we watched TV <laughs> in black and white. <laughs> My school from kindergarten through senior and high school was all white. And one day, I'm just downtown. And we did have a town downtown. It was one street, two blocks long. Okay. A young African-American stopped and asked me directions. He was headed to Charleston, 13 miles down the road to Eastern Illinois University. 
And I said, you're right on the right way. Just hit Route 16 here and go 13 miles and the university will be on your left. <laughs> and I noticed something. There were people peering out the windows of the laundromat. There were people suspiciously watching this young man and me from the windows of the grocery store. There were old men who didn't have enough hair to be in the barber shop, but they were in there anyway because that's where they hung out. And they were peering out the windows. There's a black man in town. I thought, this is in Mississippi. This is Illinois. What's wrong with us, people? You know, we watch movies like Remember the Titans. T.C. Williams High School in Virginia. And the blending of a white school and a black school in the South. And the struggle to work through those racial tensions. And we get to the end of the movie where Gary Battier is being buried. It's his funeral. And his old teammates are lined up there. And they say that the tension still exists. But when, when it gets tough, rather than reaching for hate... We remember the Titans. And we watch those movies and tears come to our eyes and the hair stands up on the back of our necks. And then we peer out windows at people who are different than us. They're Asians. Chinese. Vietnamese. Cambodian. Korean. I drive a Kia. It's a Korean car. The Latinos and they're Mexican or Colombian or Venezuelan. We just threw, drove through the American northern plains and west, and there are Native Americans. They're red. Or they're from Congo or Tanzania, and they're black. You know, sometimes we tend to look at the church as though it is all white Midwestern morality. Because that's where we grew up and that's what we know. Do you know the church is much bigger than that? Now accounting for time changes, cut me some slack. But in China where Christianity is not in favor, we have brothers and sisters meeting secretly to worship the same Lord that you and I are worshiping right now. Joel Stewart was just here. In Cambodia, we have brothers and sisters meeting together to worship the same Lord you and I are worshiping right now. In the Congo, there are brothers and sisters meeting together to worship the same Lord you and I are worshiping right now. In Mexico, there are brothers and sisters meeting together to worship the same Lord right now that you and I are. Does that change our perspective? See, the animosities that grew between the descendants of Noah, the descendants of Shem, Hem, and Japheth. They plague us today. They plague us today. And I agree with Martin Luther King Jr. that for it to be remedied in the church, the church will have to be the remedy. Washington, D.C. isn't going to fix it. Springfield, Illinois isn't going to fix it. You and I are going to fix it. You and I will fix it. God's promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The promise of one who would crush the head of the serpent still rings true. It runs through every page of Scripture. Chapter 11 ends with the descendants of Shem through Peleg to Abraham, the father of the Hebrew race, if you will, 
through whom will come Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world. He is the hope of our one race because of His blood. Did you catch that? Did you see what I tried to do? We are all of one blood, but even more so because of His blood. And there will come a time. The Apostle John is given the vision of the future. It's in the book of Revelation chapter 7. Envision this, if you will. After these things, I looked. Behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and every tribe and people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation be to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. We're going to sing. It is an invitation to come to the Lamb. But more than that, I want it to be a challenge. May you and I be the difference. May you and I be the difference. Would you stand as we sing? bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace. Amen. Amen. We are so happy that you were able to join us today. I, I pray that you have a blessed week um, and a safe and happy 4th of July. <laughs>